Thank you, Todd, and thank you, Stefan, as well, because I think it really lines us up into um, perhaps the data we've been pulling together for the last few years. Um, and that is, I think there's two points. Um, we beat ourselves up constantly about not actually serving our patients in terms of the calories and protein. I just want to present <coughs> some data. Perhaps we don't need to beat ourselves up quite so much about uh, the drive there. Um, but I want to talk about the metabolic phenotype um, and looking at patients and their skeletal muscle in the ICU. Um, I have no conflicts of interest. Now, we set up a, a group uh, some 10 years ago, uh, the Muscle UK Critical Care Program, which was focused on skeletal muscle and skeletal muscle wasting to weakness to outcome. And then obviously outcome in terms of clinical outcome. And it's through that pragmatic approach we feel we've actually developed and delivered on data in this area. But it's taken a huge volume of individuals to come together, both clinicians and scientists, which allow us to do this translational research from bench to bedside. So really, I want to highlight this as probably the groundbreaking research that drove us forward. So this is Bernard de Jong and Tarek Shasha, who were based in Paris at the time, looking at skeletal muscle weakness and its impact or um, uh, to patients, and also Margaret Herridge's work that she published obviously in New England um, back in 2003. But this drove us on about muscles and how important skeletal muscle was. Then there's a huge leap of faith. And I can say that huge leap of faith may be not only in the trials of early mobilization, but also in nutrition. But let's have a look at the trials when we look at the leap of faith in early mobilization. <coughs> and really, it's five pivotal trials, two are positive, single center trials, three are negative, neutral, whatever we like to call it. And really, it doesn't influence necessarily our clinical practice. It tells us how difficult it is, and it's probably related on timing and dose, but it's not simple. This is not a step where we can say to all patients, we should mobilize them within the ICU. So step back. Can translational science help us in the development of clinical studies? And I want to go right to the top. I want to go to skeletal muscle wasting. I want to go to skeletal muscle wasting in the ICU. And what have we learned so far? Well, let's go back to that paradigm. Let's go from structure to function to clinical outcome, to functional outcome to clinical outcome. And with that, there is a huge array of studies which have shown us the impact of critical illness on skeletal muscle, both the diaphragm and peripheral skeletal muscle. It occurs rapidly and early. It can be exceptionally pronounced. Diaphragm dysfunction is twice as frequent as peripheral muscle weakness, and diaphragm and limb weakness are predictors of clinical outcome. These are key. But how do we pull that together? And what I think is really important to take home is the severity of the illness determines your degree of muscle wasting and the chronic health that you actually enter the ICU in determines your trajectory of recovery. So with that in mind, how can we assess skeletal muscle and think about developing ways to enhance or defend against skeletal muscle? This was data we presented now five years ago in the JAMA session at the SICM. But it's still incredibly important because that work is the work that I'm going to just go on to show you, which is new data. So we know, having introduced ultrasound, we're looking at rectus femoris cross-sectional area, that if you're single organ failure, there'd be little change over that first 10 days. However, two to four organ failure, you're looking at 20 to 26% respectively loss in cross-sectional area. Patients are wasting away. Muscle turnover, when we look at that, and these were studies done with biopsies at day one and day seven, and you see at the beginning of the ICU stay, the critical care patient is the same in terms of muscle protein synthesis of that of a fed control. By the end of day seven, muscle protein synthesis has risen, and in fact, by the end of day seven, muscle protein synthesis has risen to the level of a fed control. 
However, muscle protein breakdown is high and remains high throughout that first week of critical illness. These are all ATP-dependent processes. They all need energy. And I think it's really key for us to understand the metabolic phenotype of the patient, and this is data we've just recently published in Thorax. And what we wanted to understand was about ATP and energy bioavailability. And indeed, to understand the drivers of rapid and early muscle wasting in the critically ill patient. The ATP, <coughs> when you compare it to the control, falls from day one to day, day seven. So what you see, the ATP at day one is lower controls and then it falls further. So energy is falling. If you look at the phosphocreatine, and obviously phosphocreatinine is important because phosphocreatinine will actually combine ADP with a phosphate ATP. So it will produce its driving energy. But what you see is phosphocreatine is falling from day one to day seven. When you look at creatine, it's a different picture. And what we see is from day, day one, compared to the controls, the creatine is the same. And obviously, if you have creatine that's high, then it would actually be driving in the reverse direction for ATP and energy production. So pulling that together, what we need to think about is the substrates. And the substrates we're using for ATP generation, you've heard about glucose. <coughs> And obviously, glucose is a central component through glycolysis to pyruvate and into the Krebs cycle as acetyl-CoA. Now, if you can't utilize glucose, what else can you use? Well, you can utilize fats. And so we can utilize fats through beta-oxidation. And it's really key because once you get critical illness with hypoxia and inflammation, we know that pyruvate will be generated or driven toward lactate and so we'll be having to drive for fats. We'll be having to drive fat and beta uh, lipid oxidation. So when you look at the interrelationship between the mitochondria, and in particular biogenesis of the mitochondria, its interaction with the electron transport chain and those enzymes which are membrane bound within the mitochondria, and then how that drives into beta oxidation. As I say, if we're not utilizing glucose, we've got to use another energy substrate. What we see over the first week is a reduction in biogenesis. We are not producing the same number of mitochondria. And so you see a reduction in copy number in terms of the mitochondria, as well as the enzymes such as PGC1-alpha, which is the master regulator of the mitochondria. Interestingly, there's no change in the electron transport chain. So we see a reduction in the mitochondria, but no change in the electron transport chain in terms of the enzymes. But when you look at beta oxidation over that first week, there is a reduction. So there's a reduction in lipid metabolism. And not surprisingly, there's a rise in intramuscular phospholipids. So we're increasing the amount of lipid that's actually in the muscle. So when you look across, you see that from the biogenesis point of view, mitochondria, it's reduced. From the electron transport chain, there's no change, but the beta oxidation is reduced. So why is ATP impaired? And I don't think it takes a lot to decide why ATP might be impaired. The top is just a H&E histological slide of a patient at day one and then day seven who had multi-organ failure you see there is loss of the architecture of the muscle completely. You see the inflammatory cells moving on. And when you look at the immunostaining, you can also see inflammatory cells moving in. There's a huge amount of necrosis in the study that we did. We found greater than 50% of the muscle biopsies showed necrosis. But how can we pull this complex orchestra together? So you can use multidimensional network analysis looking at key areas. And the key areas we wanted to look at was skeletal muscle wasting, but look at the bioenergetics, the inflammatory status, the hypoxic status, and look at it in the context of protein homeostatic signaling. So we were pulling this together over that seven day period. Now this is the network analysis. Every time I put this up, I say sit in a dark room, 
with a cold towel around your head because it's incredibly complex. But we work with some phenomenal mathematicians. So the boxes are all Markov's clusters. So they're, they're clinical boxes. They're the boxes that we recognize. Protein turnover, muscle inflammation, carbohydrate metabolism, and lipid delivery. A green line is a positive correlation, a red line is a negative, and the thickness of the line tells you the strength of that correlation. So when we look at these in detail, what we actually find is that decreased ATP, decreased creatine, decreased phosphocreatine availability are directly and closely related to acute skeletal muscle wasting. <coughs> the activation of the hypoxic inflammatory signals are closely related and directly related to impairment of the anabolic signaling pathway. And then the changes in intramuscular ATP and getting back to nutrition and delivery of fats, um, intramuscular ATP and skeletal muscle mass are unrelated to the quality, the quantity of liquids that are being delivered. So we've got impaired biogenic status, we've got anti-anabolic inflammation, and we've got bioenergetically energe ener inert fat delivery. So there is reduced ATP, there's a driven by intramuscular inflammation, and indeed that may contribute to the rather disparate outcomes we've had from clinical trials, both in nutrition and in terms of rehabilitation. So the lipid component, enteral and parental, is biologically inert during the beginning of critical illness, that first week. And then it's really important, as you heard from Stefan and Todd, we're giving a lot of lipid, and it's not just lipid in feed, if we look at propofol. So there's a lot of lipid going into the system, and we know if you're in a high-fat feeding state, you're turning off oxidative phosphorylation. You're reducing GLUT4 expression. GLUT4 expression actually allows glucose transport into the cells. So there's a real issue here by giving patients too much fat resulting in intramuscular fat deposition. So where do we think we can go in the future? We're building a translational science picture to help our next clinical trials. I think we need much more in terms of non-invasive techniques to look at mitochondrial function. I think we've got to develop strategies which are going to ameliorate uh, mitochondrial function. And obviously things like exercise will help promote mitochondrial function. But it's the time in. It's interestingly, you heard the data about the protein when it's delivered too early or at the wrong level, you're going to have a bad effect. And we saw that when we looked at our study, that in fact the higher levels of protein were associated with greater muscle wasting. And that's probably around the muscle full effect because we know when we load the system continuously with protein, as we do with continuous feeding, protein synthesis gets switched off in healthy controls after about an hour and a half. So there's inflammatory targeting, which I think needs to be key. Again, exercise as well as pharmacological agents. And should we consider, perhaps in the early stages, removing the fat delivery from patients as they come through the door of the ICU? Thank you for listening. <laughs>